today, uh, my name is I'm DS Nate, and today we've got Kai, Sean Lester, and Echoes of Us. Uh, hey guys. Hi, hi. Hey, yeah. Hello. Greetings, <laughs> people of Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so today um we got a topic. Um, It's regarding, I guess, about age, I guess, age, what? The age of concept, but like basically whether like children and like the media they consume and like what is considered i guess fair play in that um i think since it was kite you it was your since your topic if you if you want you can do like a kinky introduction like your thoughts on it and, and sure whatnot. not a problem and i will also invite echoes to um participate as well because um this is a topic that we kind of um discuss together at one point while we were in here mm -hmm. so i'll kind of go with um what the point is basically um when it comes to um children's media be it like cartoons um children's books among other things we were kind of talking about how specific topics are broached within their within media typically some might assume that we kind of need to like downplay a message in order to you know kind of make sure that we don't go too far and yeah i can understand that that's definitely something that i can actually get behind because i do believe that if we're going to broach some topics there has to be some degree of an idea of who we're aiming, aiming at however at the same time it is more than possible for very harsh and very heavy topics to be covered within children's media and I do believe I, I have a few good examples to point to, so I'm hoping throughout our discussion today we'll kind of be able to lean into the topic of whether or not um, specific topics regarding, like, let's say, abandonment, death, racism, abandonment, among other, among other heavier topics, how well they can be covered within children's media, and whether or not it is appropriate to do so. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I would definitely definitely mean by that. Um, I guess my first thoughts when you when you say that is kind of like, I think some people they kind of see me there as in, not say the surface level. I, I'm still trying to like, run my thoughts in it, but like there is there is the there is the stuff I think a lot of people can agree on, especially with kids. Like let's not show them like gory violence necessarily. Oh, and stuff. Uh, like, right, like, yeah. Exactly. So so I'm just trying to like, get like just line up like where where the, the the line is when we go with this so there's this obvious stuff where it's like okay yeah let's not show me all the explicit explicit stuff but you can still explore topics and stuff that are that are kind of reaching there without being explicit necessarily and those are i guess is what the the conversation is going to mainly be about because in that regard i do have a, i guess a few examples i i, I feel like i could just almost say uh avatar the last airbender and just sit back and call it a day drop the mic but um, I won't do that. But uh, yeah, I think beyond that, like I've got, I think I've got like a, a one example, a few examples. I think One Piece in my head is like a one example of them dealing with really dark issues, but in a way that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that you have to be like of age to to actually like consume. Um, I don't go. I don't. I don't go. Don't go too much to specifics because I don't get too spoilery. But I think how it explores. Um, if anyone's seen it, um, boy, boy Hancock's story. What for one example? There's plenty in there, but one that one kind of sticks in my head recently because I um, like how it how it implies what happened without implying what happened, is uh, is mm. is like one really good example of going into themes that are dark but with but in a way that if you are if you're a child that will probably go over your head anyways and if you were think and old enough to understand you understand it but it doesn't give you the explicits of it um so that's, mm. i think that's a really good example yeah yeah i see what you're saying i wouldn't really classify one piece uh, okay like on a surface level it does look like a kid's program and mm. in all fairness that is how I originally consumed One Piece when it was on TV uh, under the four kids dub. So I were so when I sort of watched the Funimation version, uh, needless to say, I was floored by how violent it act actually was. Mm. So um, yeah, I wouldn't really. So that, yeah, I don't see what you're saying. Though I think One Piece, like particularly, has always been a bit more mature in mm. tack 
tackling these uh, kind, kinds of themes and sort of relies on... I wouldn't say, like, relies, but it's definitely, like, it doesn't shy away from the sort of uh, grimness of, like, the top topics at, ha at hand. Uh, and always, like, takes them, like, very seriously. I think my favorite ones are, is, like, the fish, the story of the fishmen, and particularly um, Fisher Tiger. Uh, who, who's, I... uh, Oh, no, but, go on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go who, on. Who uh, generally, like, despite, like, the fact that he hated humans, he his dying wish was that his hatred dies with him. It shouldn't continue. Mm. So, um, I'll try to see if I can ground things a bit to kind of narrow things down. I'll try to mention shows that are definitely more aimed for a younger audience, probably somewhere around the ages of 8 to 12. I am probably going to stay within that range for some of my examples. Okay. So, I'll, I'll go with a classic example that I think most people are already aware of. I'm going to talk about Rugrats for a moment. So, how many of us here have seen Rugrats? The, um, that old classic on Nickelodeon? God, it's, it's been, it's been years. Days, I have, been ages. I have <laughs> forgotten everything. <laughs> so, I, I, remember those, I remember those Rugrats and they was all grown up. And, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I'm going to mention a particular episode that really resonated with me hard, and it is an episode that I confess, I have only watched twice because I cannot watch it a third time, and I will explain why. So, The Rugrats is a series that follows these um, 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 a set of babies, um, Tommy, Chucky, Phil and Lil, Angelica, and their parents. Now, I want to emphasize parents for a minute because every Rugrat has a parent to go home to. However, Chucky is the only person who we don't really see a mother with. Tommy has his mom, Angelica has her mom, Phil and Lil have their parents, and um, Tommy, of course, lives with his parent, um, with his mom and, fa and mom and dad. But Chucky is the only person we've ever seen with his dad. Otherwise, um, his name is Chaz. Now, in an earlier episode, we do get a reference to Chucky's mom at some point, but we never see her. But then we get an episode that finally tells us what happened. Basically, Chucky spends the entire episode trying to understand who his mother is alongside his friends. And alongside that happening, the date of her birthday is coming up, I think. And Chaz is having a hard time broaching the subject because Chucky's mother is no longer with us. She's gone. Mm. And Chucky doesn't really understand this, doesn't really understand the concept at the moment. And neither do the rest of the cast. The only thing that they know is that his mother is, is not there. And the thing is, we as the audience, we also know she's not there. However... Chucky, you know, being as innocent as he is, eventually finds like a bit uh, a box that was left behind by his by his mother that contains a series of poems and a lot of other things that she left dedicated to her son. So after Chucky was born, she basically got into a lot of complications with her health and everything. But in her in her death, um, she left behind a series of poems that Chucky was to read up until he got to a certain age. And when he found those poems, he brought them to his to his um to his father. And Chaz finally decided to sit down with Chucky and tell him that his mother is no longer here. However, the poems that she's written are written from the perspective as though she's actually right next to him. So she says things like, "While I am not with you, if you feel the wind, that is me that is me caressing you. If you feel warmth in the night, that is me holding you." That has got to be one of the most painful explorations of death without it really feeling as though it's talking down to the audience. Like, remember when I mentioned earlier that I've only watched this episode twice? That is why. I mm. can't watch it a third time because I know if I watch it, I'm going to be a mess. Mm. It is a very honest and frank explor exploration of death. It does not shy away. That show was made for children, but it has one of the most potent commentaries on loss that I have ever seen. And the crazy thing is, it's not the last time this subject comes up in Rugrats. Like, there is actually a sequel for this episode in the form of Rugrats in Paris, which is a movie that follows um, the idea of Chaz finding another person to marry, and thus Chucky getting a quote-unquote new mommy, as he puts it. Mm -hmm. However... There is not a moment where we are unaware of the fact that Chucky's mother is no longer here. 
but we are also given comfort in the sense that she's not really gone. She is very much alive in the legacy that she left behind for her son. So, yeah, mm. I figured I figured that would be a really good example to start out to start our episode with. Mm. Mm. No, I see what you mean. It's like it's it doesn't like for the people who know who are old enough to understand, they'll get it. But mm-hmm. it's, the, it's what's not being said that makes it so heavy. And if the people young enough not to really get it, it'll still be satisfying to watch or understand. Or, or understand. It could be one of the ones where when they grow up, they, it hits them. I'm like, oh my days. Yeah. Wow. Like, it, like, it's, like it's brutal, man. Mm. Like, like um, I'm trying not mm. to get too emotional while I talk about it because it is genuinely one of the most heart-wrenching things I've ever seen. Because even when I was a kid, I understood what they were trying to say. But as an adult... I am genuinely terrified by that episode because of how real it is. Mm. And it's not like the episode spends a majority of its time being doom and gloom. It's actually a very uplifting episode, but it's because it's so uplifting mm. and unflinching in what it discusses. It is just so raw. And it yeah. doesn't help that Chucky was already my favorite character of the bunch. So knowing that he has that kind of dilemma and the fact that Chaz has that dilemma, it just makes Rugrats one of the one of the best shows that you could ever broach this subject with. Like, if you want to portray death in a way in which it doesn't feel this horribly doom and gloom and edgy, but this sense of emotion and what is what was once there no longer is, I can't think of a better kid show that does this better than Rugrats. Like, Avatar The Last Airbender comes very close to this in more ways than one. But I'd mm. argue that that um that that Rugrats is far rawer in its portrayal. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it definitely hits more to home because it's more re- it's it's more relatable. I think I guess maybe I'd say it's really different. It could just be a, a difference in genre as well, and also just like the um mm-hmm. the the theme of like X Rugrats is like they they are babies to begin with, but then there are the adults there, so they already have that contrast already to really lean on um mm. even more so um. And so- yeah. Like they they manage to blend the narrate the, um, the narration between the two so well. On one hand, you have a child who doesn't have his mother anymore, and he wants to understand what happened. And then you have the father who obviously knows the truth, but he just doesn't know how to approach his son about the topic. Mm-hmm. And he, his family is telling him that he needs to talk to Chucky about it someday. But Chaz genuinely does not know what to do here because mm. again mm. he hasn't he obviously has not recovered from the loss of his wife i don't think he ever does in the course of the series even with even though he gets married later on to kira what mm. gets me of course is that it's really chucky that that bridged the gap by finding this stuff to begin with like the son mm. bridged the gap despite not really knowing or understanding mm. what all of this is about yeah yeah, it's that that contrast that makes it even more heavier. Because like, even, I've not watched that episode, but yeah, that is that is that is heavy. That is yeah, like mm. like uh, I said, like I I cannot watch it a third time. If I, I do, I am going. It is going to kill me. <laughs> I'll be honest. I Fair I enough. can't remember. I don't even know if I've actually seen that. Because yeah, I, but, I didn't, I, but I didn't all that is like I haven't. I did. I never didn't really watch Rugrats. Mm-hmm. I like, think. I think right. it was only aired a select few amount of times. I think, like, um, no, my, that, that might, might have that might have that might have something to do with it because it is heavy. Like, yeah. mm. good God, is it heavy? And I have some other examples I can talk about, but I figured I'd use Rugrats to kind of help set the tone. Because if there's mm. anything else that you can think of, or just to kind of help to go into like techniques that we can use, I figured. Mm. That I, is a very good basic example. That yeah, know. well, I actually thought of an example while you were uh, going through Rugrats, and like I think it, I think it's like because it was, it's something I'd say a lot of cartoons uh, did back then. It's like the idea of like a you know a cartoon is like for some of the kids to watch, but you do have it, but um, sometimes mum and dad has to watch it with you, so mm-hmm. it's. It was this sort of like tech. It's something I've noticed now, sort of rewatching some of these. Uh, well, just watching like clips of some of these old things because I no longer have any streaming service. Um, but it's just like how much like adult humor is actually in some of these shows. But mm. it's 
written in a way that it's you can only understand it if you're an adult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, my now my example is SpongeBob. Oh, yo. <laughs> so I may not have watched uh, Rugrats, but I did watch SpongeBob, and I'm I'm gonna specifically say like um the early SpongeBob, so like '90s stuff. And yeah, there's a lot of like um, adult humor sort of weaved into that. I think a good one is so I think like it's. Um, I'm actually going to bring up Squidward because uh, while we sort of like because of like how my attitude was like my brother mm -hmm. sort of because uh, I grew up with like th uh, two brothers and my brother basically said like I I more like Squidward than SpongeBob and he sort of said that as sort of like a bad way because like you know as a kid you always want to be SpongeBob and mm. you sort of you know the chi the child with a really annoying laugh. Uh, that's just running around like an idiot, and then Squidward's just like the gr the sort of Grinch that you don't understand why you can't be happy. The thing is, now as an adult, you sort of realize Squidward's actually the normal one. He's worked yeah. he, as he's like what he has some of the best lies. I think one of them. Uh, in case you don't know how it works around here, I order the food. You cook the, cook food, the food, and the customer gets the food. the food. We do that for forty years, and then we die. <laughs> <laughs> it's just—it's just the way he says that final part that just makes it hit so much home. And again, it's only something you'd what? understand if you're an adult, and particularly if you've worked in retail or fast food. Because, because from the child's perspective, it is, it's just Squidward being Squidward, and it's mm. funny because of how blunt he is, but when you're an adult and watch it again, you start, you realize that existential dread, mm. this grind that you're put to the moment you become old enough to figure out how to run a cash register. Yeah. You figure out how to do all of this stuff. Now we have a situation where a lot of a lot of the, the the horrible grind and the the everyday struggle becomes referenced in a cartoon where the point of the matter is you're just watching a silly sponge and his fish friends just doing silly stuff. But it turns out, no, this is a commentary of, of the life that awaits everyone. Yeah, we, I think that's we like are all Squidward. And hell, hmm. I have an uh, um, let me add another example to SpongeBob. The episode with him eating the Krabby Patties to the point where he explodes. It's oh, an yeah. allegory for addiction, drug addiction. Uh, yeah. That's not something that you can portray in most kids' shows lightly either. Also, yeah, also like the punchline is, what's going to happen? Will I explode? No, no worse. It's, it's going to go right to your thighs. And, and then, then you blow up. up. <laughs> <laughs> like, it is so dark. Like, genuinely, like, I don't mean dark in the sense of, oh, ha, ha, like, a bunch of people just died. No, it is mm. dark in the sense that that happens to people. People get addicted, and and by the time they realize um, just how bad it gets, it's too late for them to do anything about it. Like, mm. it is not easy to portray anything regarding addiction, depression, assault, or anything in a kid's show without 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 really pushing your boundaries. But somehow, Spongebob managed to do it in a way in which that it is easily interpreted and easily caught. Hell, if you if you want to take it a step further, um hook the hooky episode where Spongebob and Patrick are playing with the hooks and everything, that is also an allegory for it too. Spongebob mm. is actively shirking his duties because he can't get enough of the high. Of the yeah. high of disobeying authority and the high of the hooks. Like the whole thing with SpongeBob and Patrick coming down from the sky, just going, woo hoo hoo hoo. They are literally high, higher than a kite. Mm. No pun meanwhile, intended. meanwhile, Squidward has to deal with rude, with a lot of rude customers. Which is, again, something yeah, that we can all relate to. Like, yeah. it's funny back then, but when we, but, but, but the perspective that we have as an that... adult. I don't know. Now it's quite funny because uh, generally y the one thing you shouldn't do is yell at someone saying, "Why do you eat this stuff anyway?" Exactly, <laughs> as much as you want to. 
<laughs> which again is a question that we all have is that is that we all want to ask at one point but we genuinely can't because we know the axe is waiting for us the moment we do it which again mm. it's crazy how much a kid show could do this and um i have another example but let me hold off on it for a bit i yeah i actually to, i, I, I actually got another water. example that yeah. sorts of relates to spongebob because i learned recently one of the uh, writers of spongebob was involved in the show it was uh have any of you seen chowder Yes, actually. Oh, no, nah, that is like has some of the most meta because that has some of the most meta humor I've ever seen in a show. That uh, that's kind of the point where like I even to this day I still love it, and it's just like humor that's so completely on point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was just listening to your examples because um. And it's really interesting. I think, I guess, and we might, we might see, you could probably see this, imagine seeing this yourselves, anyways. Is I think one thing that seems to like correlate between like the Rugrat one and this one, like most of the SpongeBob, but the Rugrat one as well, is this contrast with the light, like the lightheartedness mixed mm -hmm. in with like a little bit of, a little bit of the realism or darkness. Mm -hmm. So, like, for example, mm -hmm. like SpongeBob has the comedy and they kind of they hide that realism in the in the comedy so mm -hmm. you have obviously like um patrick and you see oh hey you know this this especially when you're young you're like, oh this guy is just being he's just being a downer what's what's, what's this guy ha, ha. Mm -hmm. and his stuff is funny and his stuff stuff's all mm. funny when you grow up but then you realize oh my gosh this guy's talking about me <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no this, this man is us yeah this exactly. man yeah, is me us. we are yeah, all exactly in, oh, a, man, in, a, in, a, in a tragic sense we all grow up to be squidward he yeah. is tragically our the destination that we can await when we become adults now at that point it is going to be a matter of so how do we choose to confront that mm. do we choose to wallow in that despair or do we do the one thing squidward did in that episode break away from it and have some fun because mm -hmm. there is an episode where he at where he's actually forced to confront the monotony that he brought himself into he found a way to make himself happier by surrounding himself with like-minded people but he realized just how empty that life was. Yeah, too. I remember that where he moved to live with everyone like him, right? And then just and then it just gr and then just the repetitiveness just ground him to the dust, exactly. at, to the point where he like, did that, exactly which again, what he. Which again is, do. and and I'm glad you brought it up because it is that is again a an allegory for the monotony that we put ourselves through every day. So once that monotony starts to become torture, we start to act out, which is funnily enough what Squidward does at the very end of the episode. Yeah. He absolutely loses it and becomes the same menace that he ran away from. But in mm. but in Squidward's own twisted sense, he really does admire how SpongeBob and Patrick live their lives so flippantly. He wants that childhood innocence back. And the mm. episode where he gets it is when he's actively rejecting the monotony that he created for himself by running away to like-minded people. Now, granted, mm. he kind of goes back to doing the same thing with how he treats SpongeBob and Patrick at the end. But I feel that if you want to sum up or give a child the idea of what the adult world is going to look like when they become old enough, Show them that episode and remind them that, yeah, you might grow up to be a Squidward, but Squidward still remembers how to have fun at the end. Yeah. Even, if it's, even if it's at somebody else's expense, he still remembers how to have fun. You probably shouldn't be a public menace, but find uh, some healthy outlet to have fun. Well, least, all he got, le least all he got was a list of orderly grievances. Which was... <laughs> Which was that the whole town was a grievance, let's be honest. <laughs> yes, it was. Even Squidward said it himself. This town has to be destroyed. Or at least painted a different color. Exactly. <laughs> mm. So I think to kind of give this like a general a general thing before we go into the other things that I had in mind. Um a lot of this comes down to how we handle and, and how we portray this topic overall. Because, again, mm. there is a very dangerous line that writers can accidentally cross when it comes to within children's media. Not, not, not necessarily because of inappropriate material, but because we may end up forgetting who we're trying to cater to. Mm. Because... An adult may be in the room, yes, but we need to make sure that the child still understands the story in a, in, um, in a sense in a sense of which it makes sense for their sensibilities. And it's not like kids are completely blind enough to the point where they'll miss something. They'll get it. 
because even mm. when I was younger, there was this one episode of Courage a Cowardly Dog I watched. There is there's a lot of them, a lot that I can talk about here, but I'm going to choose um, one that focuses on depression, as well as technically speaking, spousal abuse. Yeah, mm. there's an episode like this, and it's it's pretty gnarly. So it's mm. called the ep- it's called the Tower of Doctor of uh, Doctor Zalost. It is a very very amazing episode of, of a cartoon. If you haven't watched Cars of Cardly Dog, if you, there's one episode oh, I urge right. you to watch, it's that right. one. It is really, really good. So the episode follows a brilliant scientist by the name of Dr. Jalost. He is, quite frankly, one of the greatest minds of his time. But the problem that Zalos has is he no longer feels joy in anything. He doesn't feel any joy from success. He no longer feels joy from money. He no longer feels anything. Hell, he has a companion. He has a companion named Rat who's always with him, but Zalas can't even f- feel any joy from Rat because Rat himself has chosen to distance himself away from Zalas because fundamentally the Doctor has become a very depressing figure. And there's going to be a point in time where no matter how much you love a person, you get away from them because they are completely killing your vibe. So in order to find some degree of joy he decides to make everybody's lives miserable by shooting them with with cannonballs that make you depressed as soon as they hit you yes hmm. that's where we're going oh he's going now around. i remember this mm-hmm. he's going around shooting people with cannonballs and the moment they hit you you are hit with the same depressive spell that he suffers from so the government tries to appease him by giving him the money that he asks for When they asked him to find a way to get a cure, the doctor simply tells them, the money did not make me happy. And since I am not happy, no one gets to be happy. So there. So then what happens next, Zalas then asks Rat to give him a hug because it always calms him down. Rat goes to hug him and Zalas simply shouts at him, telling him, is this a hug? You're not even trying. If If you're not even going to try, then get away from me. Like... Even back as a kid, that outburst from him gave me chills. Because it's not played as a joke. He is dead-ass serious that he doesn't want to be around this guy anymore. And you can tell, even from Rap's flippant behavior, that he's hurt by this outburst. So I bet you're wondering, how does this episode end? It's it, depending on who you ask, it might be a betrayal of how this is portrayed, but this episode ends in a particular manner. We're now going to talk about Courage and what he does. So eventually, Zalas gets over to where Courage lives with um, Eusis and Muriel, his caretakers. Eustace is hit first at the cannonball, but funnily enough, Eustace does not change his behavior because fundamentally, Eustace is a very miserable human being. So you can't make a miserable human being any more depressed than they already are. At that point, they're just going to crumble apart from the pressure, which ironically is what happens to Eustace later on in the episode. He takes one cannonball too many and breaks apart. Something of an allegory of what happens when you push someone too far down that path, even though they may already be knee-deep into it, it's still going to destroy them eventually, which it does to Eustace. Now, Courage does overcome Zalas by ironically dropping the plums that Muriel made into the formula that makes the cannonballs. Now, Muriel stated that the happy plums that she makes can make anyone happy. Now, it feels like a quick way to resolve a problem, right? However, Zalas manages to find comfort and joy after he's exposed to them. It seems to bring back some long repressed memory that he had, something that brought him back to his younger days. And ironically, it does the same thing with Rat, although it turns Rat into a baby. I'm not exactly sure what the meaning behind that choice is. But what I can tell you is that episode does not flinch on the subject of depression. It reminds us that you are trapped in an oppressive grind. Sometimes it's not the physical that can really help you. Sometimes it's not the monetary stuff that can make you feel better about yourself. Sometimes it's just the ability to kind of go back and think about better days and then find some way to share that happiness with somebody else. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, depression is something that will eat away at us slowly. 
but we have a choice. That choice is either going to be we find some way to make us happy, but we need but we also have to remember not to make the people around us depressed either. Because at the end of the day, they're all we have. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Highly recommend watching that episode if you haven't already. It is a cinematic masterpiece, if you ask me. Mm. Yeah. Um I think I had like I feel like I had one or two examples, but that like, really Maybe just the story as a whole. Maybe I can one that like, exact, like more precise example, like in the Incredibles. I always mm-hmm. thought when I was young, there's uh, so much things. Yeah. There's so much like there's so much things in the Incredibles when I look back on them. Or as I was growing up, listen, watching them because I, I watched that so many times, and I go mm-hmm. back watching them. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, like that's what they meant, uh, and and things. Um, I think, but I don't know. I think one particular one. I, I don't think. It's, I know it's. I think it's a fairly decent example. One particular one is just the. Um, I remember when, uh, what's the name, the bad, the main bad guy. Uh, uh, syndrome. Syndrome. Now, yeah, syndrome, mm-hmm. and he was speaking about his plan, like why he's doing all this, and it's like, oh, simple, you know, I'm going to make these these cool. I made these cool gadgets. They defeated you. I'll go out and defeat this robot. My gadget will be all fame, you know everyone want to buy them then everyone gets superpowers everyone becomes super it's like when everyone becomes super no one no one will and i was like when i was young i was like huh i i, I don't know what does that what does that mean like if everyone has the powers right that means it's it's a good it's it's it doesn't sound too bad i was just i thought i thought to mom at the time so like, oh what does mm. what does that mean i said oh when everyone don't have the power when everyone has the powers then no one's special like, oh shit. oh shoot okay mm. so um there are stuff where it's just like is is in there and it like when i was young it made me think a lot and then like understanding what is what what it meant was just kind of like help me understand like just how mm-hmm. things work in the real world a lot more and also had like i don't know small small lines like um how it implied i think when he caught all, all the whole family uh it's just a small thing where he just says oh you know oh you of course he said like you've called the mum and the parents and it's like oh you got busy and when you're young, that just goes, that's, that's, you don't necessarily catch it. But when you're older, you're like, ah, the way you said everything, I see what you're seeing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I actually got, I actually got like an ex- a good, like, but now that, when you, like, you bring it, brought up Incredibles, and I mm. think a really good one that, like, again, it's something that really hits you when you're older. It's sort of the fifth, uh, 15 years later. Where you see Mr. Incredible just in this oh, cubicle, yeah. and it's yeah. basically it's it's just now that you sort of realize that you know that's sort of the hell everyone's going through now. It's just this mm-hmm. soul crush. And again, it's he's become Squidward. He's in this soul crushing grind, mm. <clears throat> and he's just like you know he's just thinking back on like his his like his old the days where he didn't have to do any of this stuff and could actually be him. Mm. Mm. And uh, there's yeah. a scene I forgot. It's when he was like arguing with um, uh, his, his, wa- his wife. Oh, is it just, yeah. just before he goes out to fight the robot and he's like, oh. No, it's be- oh. no it was before, it was when he came oh, back after demolishing right. the building. Right. Ah. After, after and they were talking about Dash's uh, graduation. Dash's he just future. said, well, he, where he basically said it's not a ceremony. He's moving from the fourth grade to the fifth grade. That's it. It's nothing special, mm. Mm. right? Like I think The Incredibles is a very good example of family dynamics, or at least what happens in a family when they where, where we reach a certain eight, where we reach a certain kind of like a mid a midlife crisis, where mm. Rob is trying to find something of a purpose, and he feels as though he's found his place again. But in the process, he's neglecting the the betterment of his family and their moments. So he has become so jaded that he cannot see the graduation ceremony as anything special. Which, in in some sense, he's not wrong about it. But the problem is, it's still something special for the sake of Dash. But mm. what gets me the most about that scene is what she says to him to his face. It's not always about you. Mm. And that was like so to get a little personal for a minute, I've seen my parents argue before. Mm. 
And that episode, and that sequence in that movie hit me at my core because I've seen this kind of thing before in real life. So seeing how how honestly it's portrayed, I can only imagine how most how some kids at that time may have felt because they they may have seen this before. It might mm. not necessarily have been over a graduation ceremony, but people can speak to points where they see their parents fighting. But The Incredibles has um, has such a has such a genuine and raw portrayal of it to the point where it almost it almost hurts to see. Mm. Like you can tell, this family is they're doing everything they can to get by, especially in this world where supers are just not allowed to be who they are for whatever reason, mm. and that repression, which again the stifling of being oneself when a society stifles people this is the kind of thing that can happen like the super thing is a bit of an allegory towards that and mm. when rob is given the opportunity to be who he is by going to the island doing whatever syndrome puts him through he feels as though he's living as honestly as he can and we see what happens in res as a result of that he gets healthier he gets fitter all of this stuff he starts to improve Mm. Um, physically but the problem is in the process he is he is neglecting his rock at the end of the day i mean it's mm. good to find that strength in yourself but when you have a family there is a responsibility that comes along with that and the incredibles mm. portrays that exceptionally well despite the fact that it's supposed to be a kids movie again but mm. to kind of loop it back around to what i was talking about in the beginning a lot of this really comes down to the tact and ensuring that the kids also have something to something to hold on to. This is a superhero story, yes. And we get that awesome big superhero um, fight near the end and in the middle of everything. We get all of that. But there's so much material to chew on to the point where you can still enjoy this. You can still enjoy the kitty side of it. But as a young, but, 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 um, but as a youth, you can still see parts of yourself reflected on the screen through your um, through the parent through the portrayal of the parents. Because again. You've probably seen your parents arguing before. You probably see your you probably seen your dad go out for long undisclosed periods, and you don't know what to make of it. Or you start to worry about: Are your parents even going to be okay? Because mm. I because here's the thing: Dash and Violet bring this up in the movie. Yeah. They actually yeah, bring up the fact that they yeah. like, like you you see this is not an accident. They know exactly what they're doing. Mm. Like um, and of course. And while we're on this, well, while we're on the subject of superheroes, um, before we start to get into the more darker aspect of this topic, because I think, um, I mean, because when Echoes and I were talking about it, we did start to go into the more, um, to, um, to the more darker aspects. But the topics that we're talking about are already pretty messy to begin with. So, mm -hmm. um, I'll mention this last softball example I can think of. So, in there's an episode of Teen Titans all about um, Starfire. Well, not really all about her, but it's centered on her. So there is a character, I don't remember his name, but he came from another planet. And when the Titans approach him, he seems kind enough. However, when Starfire approaches him, we notice that his demeanor starts to change. He says, No one, you didn't tell me that you had a Tamaranian with you. He had a moment where he paused. Like he hesitated to call her a Tamaranian. And there's a reason for that. You see, Starfire is nothing but nice to him. But in a later scene where she tries to approach him, he tells her, get away from me, Troc. Troc is a racial slur to Tamaranians. And it's something that Starfire mentions very later on in the episode. So mm -hmm. this topic is the subject of racism. And mm -hmm. it comes up quite a bit in this episode. Like, it gets it gets to a point where Starfire is doing everything she can not to rock the boat. So he simply allows her allows the guy to call him a, call her a truck, and without mentioning anything, because as far as the Titans are concerned, they don't know what he's calling her. Mm. And when they confront her about it, Starfire meets, says it means an it means an something about a an extraordinary person or an odd person or mm. or someone who is different, basically. Mm -hmm. So. Cyborg walked up to her, which I'd like to point out that Cyborg is a black male. So when Cyborg called her a truck, she lost her mind. She goes, don't ever call me that. So when, so when Cyborg starts to ask her what the problem is, she explains where this term comes from. And Cyborg looks to her and says, I've got an idea of what you're talking about. People have judged me the same way. That's not an accident either. 
-hmm. He's a black man. He would know about he would know about slurs himself. So they bond over that. And as when the episode comes to an end, the Titans realize just how um, just how racist he's been the whole time. But Starfire does not hate him for it. In fact, right before the character disappears, like he goes back to goes back to space, he says, "Not bad for a truck, Tamaranian." Starfire corrects him and tells him, "You can say what you want, but I know my worth. I know who I am." Like she doesn't, she doesn't yell at him. She doesn't shout at him. She just lets him mm -hmm. go on her, go on the way. She doesn't even give him the courtesy of anger or hatred. Mm. And it is probably one of uh, one of the raw. I don't, I don't, like like I said before, there are many different ways to portray racism within well, within media. Like we see this all the time within different shows. Like we see it in The Wire, for example. We see it within The Wire. We see it within video games. Like it is a ever-present theme in anything we see but it, but teen titans covers it in a manner in which i don't think i get to see very often like it, mm. it could have been an episode about cyborg but the problem is you can't really use this that slur when you're doing a kid's show you can't do that mm. but for here they managed to bridge the gap by having Starfire approach Cyborg about it. Because again, like I said, if anyone would know about, about experiencing racism, it is more than likely Cyborg in that, in that particular show. So mm. what I think makes it stand out is despite the censors or despite whatever hiccup that they could have potentially run into, we have a situation where we managed to connect the experience to the Black experience, and then we managed to make this experience of racism universal. Because Cyborg is not the only "quote unquote" minority that we have right in front of us. Technically speaking, Starfire would count as one herself. So we managed to make this conversation way more <laughs> universal because of who we chose to focus on. So mm. yeah, if if there is a way in which you can cover racism, I think that's a very good way of handling it. As well as if you need to dodge the censors for whatever reason, yeah. Mm. That was a brilliant mm. way to do it. Mm. Yeah. Also, I think I actually... it also, sh oh, sorry, also showed like a good example of how to like probably handle a kind of situation like that. Mm -hmm. it, ideally, obviously, these things don't go tr track real, mm -hmm. you know, one to one in real life. But like, just mm -hmm. like she handled it with like dignity and everything like that. I think that's good. What were, what were you gonna say though, Echoes? Oh yeah, no, I just wanted to provide an example before the topic changes. Mm -hmm. um, that's all yeah, because it's slightly related to your example, Kite. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, because one of the shows I wanted to talk about was uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds. Oh, which, nice! Um, I, don't remember, I, ha I don't remember if I watched it completely, but I remember at least the beginning relatively well. So, um, in case if you haven't watched it, it's, it was dubbed by four kids. Mm -hmm. And it's, has one, it's one of the only show, Yu-Gi-Oh! shows with a relatively older protagonist mm -hmm. compared to other ones. But one of his standout features about the protagonist is that essentially, he, or you say, is that he was from a place, like, in a way, his world was split into two. There's, like, the rich city, I forgot the name, <laughs> the rich city, and then they had, and then where he was from was essentially a little part outside the city that was considered, like, a trash heap. Those were all the criminals and all the people who were considered to be low worth lived mm -hmm. and that in a way create a sort of i don't know uh, it's definitely a, a difference in status sort of thing, yeah. in in a way racism as well mm -hmm. where people from that trash heap are considered inferior human beings they're not considered even human um because of where they lived and in a way those people all they wanted to do was just be accepted by the people on the mainland who has always ostracized them in in a way that is also, if I remember correctly, it's a, a why um, the main character's father was trying to bring the, both of them together. Oh, yeah, it was called the satellite, by the way. Was mm -hmm. it? I remember now. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you say is always uh, knew that he wanted, even if he was from the trash heap or, or from the satellite, right? He still wanted to be acknowledged in. In a way, people would do whatever it takes to escape because, in a way, no one would, would be allowed to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he ended up leaving because his friend, who uh, used to uh, be with him in the satellite, betrayed him and stole his bike and his dual deck. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I just want to get what, I, what he took from me back. 
and in a way he built his own a new bike for himself and used the cars of his friends to eventually bring himself to the mainland and confront his friend. Um, and obviously they go more uh, into more on their adventures later. But I always found that that disparity between the mainland and the satellite was so different as I've never seen a Yu-Gi-Oh show ever cover it, that sort of topic in that way, in such a clear way, where, even, where it showed that even the people from the satellite had their humanity, even if it was denied from them for pretty much almost the, uh, all, of their, uh, all of its existence. Um, and because of that, I always appreciate Yusei's desire to persevere and, and eventually want to bring the satellite back to the mainland and want to bring those, pe uh, those people back so they could in, in turn re regain the humanity that they've lost. So, and uh, yeah, uh, I just want to just mention that as uh, sort mm. of adjacent to kites. Um, I don't remember all the details that well, mm. but I always remember that Yusei's existence was so interesting because of his upbringing. It's uh, different than most Yu-Gi-Oh! protagonists because of that. It's really mm -hmm. interesting how Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds is very much a series of class consciousness in that sense as well. Because we have a situation where the poor live on one uh, on one side, and then we have the wealthy or the well or the relatively well off on the others. In that sense, the idea of <clears throat> the idea of uh, of you say building a deck from the cards of his friends, those who have experienced hardship, it's very much a situation of it can it, you can really you could really put on a very dare I say leptus reading on that if you really wanted to. You could really put that kind of reading on it, for what it's worth. Not not like I'm not like I'm pushing that idea forth, of course. But the storytelling for that show, based on that setup, extre is extremely mature. Like you might think that Five Ds is pretty damn stupid because of the whole card games on motorcycles thing. I don't think anyone is going to get over that twenty years later. Probably not. But the merit that it has is incredible in more ways than one. Like it's easy for um, it's easy for for um, for twelve and thirteen year olds to see that um to see that um that side of the story you know the whole card games aspect the competitive side of things but the underlying narrative of it all of trying to find find your place in the world trying to make things better for the people around you it's a it's a it's it's heartfelt on top of that mm. it's mm. heartfelt on top of that it would be easy and. Which which, which 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 kind of transitions to what I another thing I wanted to mention as far as this topic goes. Like, it's very easy to think that children's entertainment can fall within, you know, like one idea where we don't want to be too serious or we don't want to be too obtuse with our with our meaning. But sometimes what we think is obtuse is quite straightforward. Sometimes teaching people acceptance of others from different lives uh, from different walks of life. Is as simple as just letting that person talk. Give that let 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 that person um show that person just living a regular life, just being a human being. Like if you want, um, I can think of an I can think of the most legendary example right now, Mister Rogers' Neighborhood. One, I mean, back then, the idea of portraying um having black people or even gay people on TV was seen as a bit of an anomaly. For good reason, of course, because that's how things were back in the day. However, we were able to see a black person on top of the fact that they were also gay. They were treated as human beings because that as because the aspect of their sexuality or their race wasn't that um, wasn't the point of contention. It never should be. It's something that we should be aware of. Yes, but at the same time, we have to we have to portray humanity above for above all else as human and. What ends up happening, or rather, what ended up happening was this show became far more relevant in the news because of that decision made on the set. It's why Mr. Rogers is so beloved and forever will be. Not a good example is what happened to Star Trek. Now, granted, Star Trek isn't really a kid's show per se. It's not necessarily just for kids. But Star Trek had this problem, too, that they ran into regarding a white woman, I mean, a white a white man and a black woman actually kissing on screen. That was another problem. What I'm getting mostly at here by bringing up these examples is our media, whether we like it or not, reflects a lot of what we think and how we feel. 
And our ideas of people we will probably never get to meet in life are fundamentally shaped by the stuff that we're exposed to. So what we end up having is a situation where if we're going to portray this depression, death, anxiety, all of that, how do we portray this in a way in which it doesn't, you know, doesn't punch down, talk down, or insults? How do we do that? It's the question that I think everyone has to an um, has to ask and then answer, and I don't think children's media is any different. I don't mm -hmm. think it's any different for this reason. The stories that I just um, that I've used as an example today, like Rugrats, Courage, Teen Titans, a lot of my perception was shaped because of how those shows handled their theming and messaging. And mm. If we decide to treat everything like, I don't know, like a downgraded t uh, PBS show, because let's be honest, I could use a PBS show. I mean, I've already used a PBS show. I use Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. This idea that we have that kid shows need to be, just be these overly colorful segments that have nothing to say. I don't think that's true. I don't think mm. that's true. Yeah, I disagree with that as well. Uh, in fact, I, I mourn the fact that they don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Like... Mm. It's like I'm not. It's like I'll, I'll never tell people that that uh, that it's not good. It's not a good idea to have some good, clean, dumb fun. That's perfectly fine. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's, that's per the face. Yeah. yeah, it's perfectly fine, even. But I think this idea of what kids' media should be like, not commentate on anything, not um have any allegories, not even you know broaching broaching sensitive topics. I don't think you're producing anything worthwhile for people to chew on. Mm. It's, al it's mm. almost like you're disqualifying kids from understanding anything, which, again, I don't, I don't comprehend. The last example that I want to bring up here before we either, you know, transition to um, deeper into the topic or wrap up, I do want to mention this because I've mentioned pretty much everything except for one big hot button topic that I'm probably going to get stoned for, <laughs> but I'm gonna, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So. This is a cartoon that I don't think anyone in this room has seen. I've seen it, by chance. It was called Lloyd in Space. It was a Disney Channel show on Toon Disney. Really, really good car really, really good block. Highly recommend it. But Lloyd in Space is a show that I unfortunately do not have a lot of good memories of because I barely got to watch the show much, but there was one episode that I still remember. There was so Lloyd in Space is about is about a bunch of aliens living on a spaceship going to school with the titular character Lloyd. There an alien comes to school one day. And the thing is, when they introduce themselves, they have a very neutral sounding name. So we don't know if they're male or female. So what ends up happening is that the boys and girls of the class are doing everything they can to get the alien to hang out with them. But what ends up happening is this character basically rejects both of them. And when they ask, well, what Well, what are you? Are, are you a boy or a girl? Take a wild guess what the alien says, everyone. Take a wild guess what they say. I'm neither? Yeah. Basically, I'm neither. I don't know, and I don't care. It doesn't matter. I haven't figured it out yet. Please leave me alone. Mm. We have an instance of a character being literally non-binary before we even knew what the word was in today's world. Let that sink in for a minute. This conversation has been going on way longer than um, than, than, than the Twitter outrage mob would, would, would make you believe. This subject has been here for a long time. I bring this up because Lloyd in Space handles this beautifully. This character is only trying to live a life as happily as they want, but the problem is the people around them are trying to force them into a box. They may, it, they may think they're doing a good thing by trying to get this character to kind of, like, jive with them. This character is just trying to mind their own business. They don't know if they're male or female, and they don't really care. They're mostly just trying to live a life where they can be happy. And they do like the company of the characters around them, but they absolutely hate the fact that their gender is a point of contention in this group when it doesn't have to be. And the episode ends without us getting... without. Either Cam getting an answer, or either Cam getting validated. The biggest winner is this character that I am mentioning. They're the biggest winners of this episode because, quite frankly, nothing, this does not matter to them. And it is handled with a degree of grace that I don't think we're going to see again anytime soon. And if mm. we are, they're going to have to go through a lot of hoops to do it. Because mm. this was done 
in a way that everyone can get it. Like, if you bring up the subject of if someone is neither a boy or a girl, well, what are they? Well, here's the thing. It doesn't really matter to this character. All they want to do is live and have fun. Whether or not they're a boy or a girl does not necessarily mean that they cannot enjoy the hobbies that are experienced by both genders here. And again, the episode shows this. They even, they flat out tell us that this is the case. So it's like, this the subject of gender identity is something that children's shows have dealt with before. And they portrayed this in a way in which it doesn't really seem preachy or quote-unquote agenda-driven. This is just a matter of we are portraying this character as who they want to be, what their um what their um we're portraying them as who they want to be. They are just human be well, okay, maybe not human beings because we are talking about aliens here. Let me just make that clear for a second. But they still play the anthropomorphic or god god damn it, I cannot say this word. They're still they're still stand-ins for what we understand. They're still standings for what we understand about gender and so it's kind of like, mm. yeah, I'm kind of amazed that long before the climate that we're having now, we already had this discussion, and Lloyd in Space, more than 20 years ago, handled it in a way in which most shows can't even come close to doing these days. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, mm. I think I had a question before, but I, I think it might have been answer already I, I guess i guess we kind of maybe kind of speaking around this and just by the topics you picked and why you find them compelling mm -hmm. but i guess i was good question being like if you were to like what would you say the main like the main things you would do in in a story if you were trying to make try to portray deep topics to kids but in a way that's not you know not it was not talking down to them like what would you say if there was some like if there was some some guidelines you could take like what would you think they're, they're mm. oh. it's something I i've think... been trying to mull over myself i think i kind of mm. mentioned a bit earlier mm. so i just want to do that you know, yeah you guys I, I can i can at least try to answer that at least um mm, at least when it comes to reading right if you read children's books right mm. they're rather simple right Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that they don't have the opportunity for death. It's actually because of their simpleness, because of the images they use, because of how they portray topics in a way that is meant to be accessible, it's mm -hmm. through that that children can gain the knowledge of... All, uh, it's through reading those type of things that kids can gain awareness of topics they would have never have known before. But the main point is to make it accessible, right? Mm -hmm. Because... If you make topics too complicated or use prose that's just a little too difficult to reach, kids sadly won't understand or they'll have to pull out a dictionary and look up every word they don't know. No, I, I don't think kids want to do that. <laughs> At the very least, idea. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but the, the point is, is accessibility, right? That's mm -hmm. why like when you read children's books, right? They usually, um, uh, some of them have uh, recommended ages for kids to start reading them. So that they could, you know, so that kids can be interested, right? They wouldn't want to read a book that's too challenging. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. there's some people who do, which is fine, but mm -hmm. I think some kids don't. They just want to read something that they feel that's accessible, right? Yeah. Um, but also, I just want to mention uh, something slightly adjacent is um, an issue, though, recently is that uh, kids, um, because of the pandemic, have had their reading ability... Uh, slowed Stunned. sadly mm. yeah it's been prominent mm. i don't know exact details of it. i was reading up on it but that comes with just people not taking the time and care to allow them to learn about these type of things and um it's, it's not always kids fault because it's often yeah. the influence of the parents will, will allow them to learn right mm -hmm. but and to a degree the kids willingness too but in the end it's all about accessibility right like, how yeah. can you expect a person to learn to love to read if they've never been to a library, right? Mm. Never held mm. a book in their hands. So, yeah. yeah, just, yeah, essentially it's just accessibility is the most important part mm. for kids to understand these type of concepts. Because kids are like sponges. They learn so fast. Mm. But you have to give them the opportunity to do it, so. so. Right. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. 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 You got, you got me, it's kind of like when you, when you write a story and then you're checking it with other people. 
because you're trying to make sure it's comprehensible. But obviously, with a kid, this is like obviously content to comprehensible comprehensible to a kid it's like you gotta meet him halfway um in in that regard um yeah no nah, definitely definitely agree like obviously yeah accessibility is honestly the, um, the, the, the cornerstone of it mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, yeah on, on the, my end oh no, no come on go on go on um, um oh, i'll answer oh. in a moment oh yeah sorry yeah um one also i uh, just one note as well is one great thing about manga is that it's very accessible because of his visuals. That's all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah, that's picture, definitely. Yeah, picture books yeah. Stuff, yeah, you're right, yeah. Yeah, because there's picture books usually the way to go with kids. Definitely. At a young age, and yeah, manga is just like curse, uh, basically. Yeah, yeah heck, I find I'm old and I find manga easier to read mm. because it has pictures. It's like, yep. what? yeah, for sure. Like, honestly, to answer the question, I have a hard time with it because the thing is, my target audience aren't um isn't kids. I don't think I will. I don't know if I don't know if my writing will ever allow for me to have kids as a target audience. But I'm not exactly against the idea either, because I feel the same standards of which we demand from most of our shows and our media and anything written. I think the same standards should apply to, um, should apply to children's works as well. But I genuinely do not have a concrete rule or an idea of what standard should I put forth, or rather what rule should I put forth on writing a children's story. Because I don't think it's as simple as give them, giving them pretty colors and stuff. Because listen, I want kids to enjoy stories, like whether they're picture stories or like written it. Like, I want them to enjoy one or the other. But by that token, I, I don't want to feed them vapid schlock either. I don't want to I don't want to read or watch vapid schlock. I don't want to put kids through that either. I think mm. it's wrong. I think that's I feel that's a crime in and of itself because you're actively underestimating and stifling their ability to learn. Exactly. Yeah. Because mm. like because because mm -hmm. um because my thing is and this might make me sound like a like a like a wingnut. I apologize in advance, but I, sh I I'm gonna mention it anyway. If you're not going, if, if you're not willing to teach your kids anything meaningful, who is going to teach them anything at that point? Who are you leaving that education in the hands of? Mm. I'm not. By the way, this is not me being a homeschool advocate. If that's what some people are thinking, I swear mm. to God, no, that is not what I'm saying. <laughs> what I'm getting at is. But the, you want to parents should be responsible for what goes into their thing. That's what, yeah, that's what you mean. exactly. Mm. Like you can't just go off on this idea that oh oh I don't want them watching that because of da da da. Okay, here's what you do. Here's what you do. This is what my mother did. My mother used to watch my used to watch the cart cartoons with me when I was growing up. My mom watched an episode of Inuyasha with me. I'm not joking about that. I was 14 years old and she watched an episode of Inuyasha with me and she freaking loved it. <laughs> she loved it. I am not kidding you. The mm -hmm. best thing that you can do as a parent is to sit down and watch this stuff with your kids. Now, I understand that maybe you don't want to watch Mickey Mouse's Clubhouse. Fair enough. Totally understandable. You probably don't want to watch Teletubbies. I get it. I think the Teletubbies are creepy, too. But... <laughs> Hey, my brother used to love that, that show. <laughs> I did too. Right. <laughs> but, what, but what you should do as a parent is you need to get an idea of what your kids are watching. And this isn't inherently a negative either. The best thing that you can do is engage with your child and engage with what they're watching. Because I guarantee you that there is something meaningful in those stories that's just waiting for you to, watch, um, to take in as well. Because I think the best best things within kids media isn't just for children by itself it manages it mm. manages to transcend hell most of the most of the examples that we're talking about transcend children's entertainment that's what mm. this is hell you know what else is children's entertainment technically speaking dragon ball was technically speaking for kids <laughs> mm. i watched dragon ball as a kid as well it was fun exactly <laughs> before it became z it was this whimsical, fun-loving adventure before it turned into this. <laughs> before it turned into this crazy, dark killing spree that was the King Piccolo arc. But at the same time, the reason why the King Piccolo arc was so hard to was so hard to sit through, in a good way, mind you, was because we know how fun-loving and whimsical Dragon Ball is. Hell, even, hell, this happened during the Red Ribbon Army arc too. We know how beautiful how how um how beautiful this world is, and now here comes these big nasty bullies coming to poison it for the rest of us. Mm. Like, mm. 
Like, that's mm -hmm. ballsy. That's really ballsy. Like, mm -hmm. you can have... You can have this. You can have um. You can have butterflies and fields. You can have all of this stuff. I will never tell you that you shouldn't do that, but I think a child's mind is capable of being challenged the same way ours is capable of being challenged as well. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, because I think in general, like, how do I describe it? Um, yeah, because I think in general, kids just want to experience new things and do things on their own, right? Because when you're a kid, sometimes there's just some things you're not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. But if you are given that option to, oh, I could watch this, or oh, I could read this, then they'll do it if they want to, you know? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a... I mean, with how polarizing it is nowadays when it comes to like portrayals and media and everything, it just kind of makes me nostalgic for the days of old where, quite frankly, we really didn't care. Yeah, we, we genuinely did not care. Like we were gonna, we traumatize an entire generation of kids with Chucky, with, Ch with Chucky story and Rugrats. We traumatize a generation of kids with Hey Arnold. Which I am surprised I didn't mention that. <laughs> I could say so much about Hey Arnold episodes. Like, hey, if y'all want an idea of how much we really didn't care about how nasty some things got, Hey Arnold is your example. Here, let me here, let me let me do this real quick. Hey Arnold portrayed. Um, portrayed a toxic family dynamic in the Patakis. Helga is the youngest child, but she always feels that she's playing second fiddle to her older sister, who has the love and adoration of her parents and her peers. Helga always feels like she comes second. And this show does not shy away from that for a minute. It reminds you that this is a reality that Helga lives through, and she tends to lash out against the person that she has a crush on, because her home life is that bad. And that's not even getting into the fact that Arnold himself, one day his parents left and they never came back. He's been living with his grandparents from the start of the series to the very end of the series. You only get like a couple of mentions of his parents. Now, eventually we did find out where they went. We had that movie, which I am very mixed on. But the fact of the matter is shows from the 90s, they did not care. Mm, that was... Uh... Uh, like, I barely remember the show, but Cat Dog. That was oh, the case cat, of their oh, mom oh, cat and dog dad. Is cat Dog is a good example, too, actually. Yeah, because there was a case with, like, them, like, with their, with their parents, with, like, Dog be very excited, like, where, like, how they're looking for them. With, and then Cat basically just shot, yelled at them, saying, they're not looking for us. Get that through your head. It's just didn't finish that episode, so I have no idea how it ends. But I think I remember I... it's that part that sticks out most in my mind. Like when I say that the '90s did not care, it's more like we mm. did not necessarily care whether or not the kid was either "quote unquote" too stupid to understand or too young to understand. We just did it. Mm. They just did it, and the fact that they just did it says a hell of a lot more than anyone who's just whining about how oh my god why is what why 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 would you want kids to watch oh my god it's just walk oh it's yeah. like dude heck there's like ed 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 eddie that's so much ed, ed, eddie, there's so much comedic ed, 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 eddie could not be made today it could <laughs> Absolutely not be made not. today because do you know how many jokes they got away with that are of the adult variety uh i don't even Look, I don't just want to count. Gonna, look, look, look. I don't want this podcast getting in, in, getting into trouble, but Ed and Anetti got away with so much borderline fetish stuff in every single episode that it is incredible that the show even managed to air at all in the state that it was in. It is nuts. But that's mm. why but that's why we look back at that era fondly. It's not just because cartoons were quote unquote better back then. I don't buy into that stuff either. But we were able to express these ideas without worrying about some idiot on Twitter talking about how, oh, look at all the look at all these animators are trying to poison our children's minds. And I'm like, my guy, you idiots were back th what used to be there back then. Long before every single moron had a bullhorn to go nuts, people just put, people just put these shows on TV, and look how a lot of us turned out. Mm. Look how a lot of us turned out. We turned out just fine. That's the funny part. A lot of us turned out just fine. And personally, just to kind of keep it on the topic without me turn without me turning into a to a crazy person, <laughs> I think 
I think that honesty and that earnest portrayal of things is what makes these shows worth talking about and what makes these stories worth telling. Mm-hmm. Because we can't really be too worried about how whether or not someone will understand or whether or not a parent would, you know, really want their kid watching this or whatever. We can't control that. That's completely outside of what we're able to do. The most you can do is portray your subject matter as earnestly as you can and earnest in a way in which these children or anyone witnessing these shows can comprehend it because i guarantee you a couple years down the line they are going to find you and they're going to tell you that these shows meant something to them Mm. and um there was a there was at least one more example that i wanted to mention that i thought that i think is a let me let, let me think about this for a minute, because uh, my the gears are turning in my head, but I just cannot remember what I have in mind right now. I, I did what have one example in my head. I only watched it once, and I, I I think I got some probably examples in that. But if you've only watched the last uh, Puss in Boots movie, ah uh, yes, I, that is a fantastic example, friend. I need to watch that. You do yeah. so. Puss in Boots, again, I have no idea what happened to make them want to make a sequel to that movie of all things, but I thank God every day that they did, because that movie is probably my one of my favorite portrayals of the subject of death that I've ever seen in a kid's movie. Mm. Like, Puss in Boots, as we know, oh well, Maybe, maybe maybe not all of us have watched it, so I'll just mention it. So Puss in Boots 2 follows the tale of the titular Puss in Boots after the events of the first movie. He is realizing that he is on, quote-unquote, his last life. This basically means that he's been killed several times before during his, his escapades, but he has one more life to live. However, this frightens him. Because he's been living a life flippantly where nothing scares him, no- nothing can get him down. But he's realizing that he's on his last life, and death appears in the form of a wolf. Mm. And it is reminding him that his time is coming. He can't run away forever. And most of the movie is spent with, with Puss in Boots either trying to run away or trying to come to terms with the fact that I'm not going to be here forever. And the final, the climax of the movie is him realizing that, but still defying death anyway. Like, mm. we all have to be aware of it, yes. But the, the, the thing about living is that we have to be able to look death square in the face and tell him, not today. Not mm. today. Yeah. I mean, you can fear it, yes. You can try to run away from it, yes. Mm. But there's a third option. Not today. Yeah. Not today, my friend. Mm. And I think mm. one part I always it stuck out to me just I just remember now was the part I won't get too much of the because it's really worth watching. But the part where he just like he kind of gives up on trying to do anything, mm-hmm. you know that part, and he gets all like depressed and stuff. And that's quite real. So like you know what I mean when you you see people who've like had I don't know a hard hard deal in life or 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 they're too scared to do something, so they just hold themselves back. And I had a whole little sequence with that, and I was like, "Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty real." And even like, um, I think there was other characters in there who were trying to like, I think they're going after something, and there was this guy who's just like so selfish, and he's using everyone as pawns to reach his point, reach the goal, and everything. It has a lot. It has a lot you can unpack in there for a kids show. Honestly, it was really very, cool. very much so. Yeah, all I all I know about it is death because I've seen him a lot, and all oh, that. Oh, that yeah. man, is, all, like, that is, man that is iconic. Thing oh, is, Lord. that wolf is so like it's, uh, like it's not only really, like very well voiced, but it's also so well animated. Oh, yeah. very much so. Like, yeah. it's definitely, such, definitely there's a point where I would such, not expect it to be in a Puss in Boots movie. Definitely not, especially if, if, if how you know how the first movie turned out. Like the first movie was not the best in my opinion. Yeah, I do that. that one, the first movie. I never the even watched one. the first one. <laughs> <laughs> only watch it if you're morbidly curious that is the best endorsement i can give it mm. <laughs> that's the best endorsement i can give it but what, what what man what a film and what a story to tell for a kid's film which mm. again this is kind of and you might you might kind of notice that i try not to put a distinction on any of the examples that i try to give and the reason for that is a lot of this stuff is universal 
doesn't matter yeah. whether or not it's a kid's flick or not because Kingdom Hearts was supposed to be a kid's game. Well, oh yeah, do you know how many? Mm. Do you know how many, do you know how many themes they? You know, you know the themes that they broached in that game. Mm. They broached a they broached a lot of adult what, themes in that what, game. What don't they broach? It. Exactly. Mm. What, what don't they touch? Basically, yeah. like you know, abandon, um, abandonment, inferiority, um, mm. jealousy, envy. Like these are universal ideas that can be applied to anything. It just so happens mm. that it's. Um, that it's more kid friendly than anything else, but being kid friendly doesn't automatically disqualify you from being from being fantastically told. Like mm. Lupin the Third, for example, is probably not something that I would want any of my children to read the manga anyway, because <laughs> Lupin and company have a lot of fun in the manga. Let me tell you that, son. Let me tell you that. But <laughs> Castle Cagliostro, I would definitely love my children to watch. That movie is amazing. And if they're old enough at some point, yes, they can watch the woman call Fujiko Mine when they're old enough. That is probably not something you want to show to your kids, and for good reason. Don't do it, people. Bad idea. <laughs> but Castle Cagliostro, mm. yeah, do it. Hell yeah. It is really good. Damn good movie in more ways than one. Mm. Yeah. It's pos it's because it's possible for you to take adult characters... And bring them down to a bring them down to a level in which it is easy for people to still latch onto them no matter how old they are. So I think Cagliostro is a really good example. I don't think it's a standard by which every Lupin saga should be judged by personally. I don't think it is, but it is a very good gateway if you want to introduce it to a younger audience, that's for sure. Mm. Mm. I need to watch Lupin the third. I ain't watched any of them. Oh, oh. Yeah. I, I am your man when it comes to Lupin, man. I am your dude. That is like, that is like my bread and butter. I freaking love Lupin, dude. <laughs> mm, yeah, it looks interesting. I just never, yeah, I never got around to that. Let's, yeah, I'll definitely have to get it somewhere at some point. Mm. Um, all right. Is there, I guess, any closing statements you want to give before? Um, no, nah, I'm good. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm. I guess I did ask a question before. I think I might mention it on my side already, but just like. If there was, I mean, obviously these things, like I said, it's almost like it's universal. I think that's a really good way of putting it. Like it's talking about universal themes, but just theming it in a way that is uh, understandable and accessible to to kids. And there is definitely a, a line to toe with mm -hmm. that. But I think it's definitely definitely worth mm. it's definitely worth towing if you want to tell interesting stories and you know and t you know give themes or prepare them for certain things in mm. life, which which will come and hit them. Like Sponge, example, SpongeBob's a perfect example. I remember, I yeah. do remember back in the day when I watched SpongeBob, I used to be all about SpongeBob and Patrick, and Squidward would be that guy who just seems like a bit of a killjoy, but it was funny. But now I look mm. back, I'm like, I'm like Squidward, I get it, man. It's yeah, like, we like, just okay. can't be SpongeBob and Patrick. We can only be Squ uh, We can only be a Squidward. <laughs> we can only be a Squidward. Exactly. <laughs> Even every, every SpongeBob becomes a Squidward eventually. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Remember, even, no even... one wants to be a Squidward. <laughs> True, but you can't help but be a Squidward. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. I see. And just like, it's good. It's cool to have like a, a show or medium to kind of help bridge that that gap in your life in a way where you can look back at it and you're like, oh, like in a way, I kind of was shown this. And I don't know. Just on, I guess in general, it's, it's more universal than that. But like, mm. just the um, having themes that are, you know, have meaning in life and then train it in a way that mm. is entertaining to kids. I think is like one cool mm. thing. Um, um, yeah. Oh yeah. No, I could probably also say a closing statement as well. Um, I think in general, uh, we are reminded of the shows we watch when we're young, not just for nostalgia's sake, but they probably have influenced us in some way. Mm. whether it's because we enjoyed watching them they moved us in some way whatever reason right um and in general children aren't easily influenced right mm -hmm. for better or for worse yeah. um but also they also are able to do their own judgments as needed as long as they're put into the right direction or gain the right influences oh um, yeah yeah that's really mm. true yeah, yeah and be yeah because of that i think um i think at least uh, I hope that uh, children will continue to find me shows that, you know, strike a chord in them or they find meaning in because depending on what those messages are, they'll carry them 
through with them until they become adults mm. and then until they age because they those memories are just so valuable or important or or even it could be a detriment or i don't know it, it depends on the influence right yeah it is, very, it is a very very subjective thing in, in that regard but i think just having like you said like apparently can gu- guide the their their thoughts and, and mindset in, in a way so they are best equipped as they can yeah because um yeah i guess i guess i mentioned as well as um when i was young right um mm. like i my parents definitely did not watch shows with me <laughs> They mm-hmm. would recommend, like, my dad was the one who influenced me to watch Dragon Ball and stuff. Oh, but he cool. also introduced me to watching the Ghibli films, which have mm. influenced me among mm. me having access to my parents' Netflix account for me of the pick shows I wanted to watch when their anime library was very, very small. But mm. regardless, mm. it's because of that that ability that I was able to find shows I watched. And after school, I just rewatched the Ghibli films, rewatched things that I liked, or... On Saturdays, I'd watch Pokemon until I got too old and had to couldn't do it because of tennis lessons, you know. Like, regardless, we still, like, those memories are still valuable. I think everyone, uh, if they had a good childhood, they would be reminded of those, the best memories more mm. than the worst ones, if possible. Yeah. But, um, but I just hope that kids will fi- still continue to find something they enjoy because right now, because of the internet and because of smartphones or whatever, they are so, they're uh, accessing the cesspool of the internet for better or worse and that may lead to them watching too many tiktoks or not yeah. studying or getting bad influence from people like andrew t i don't know but oh, regardless <laughs> we can we can hope that um just by being able to influence them properly kind of like how my cousins are raising their children like monitoring what they're watching wanting them to read good books making sure they're learning and stuff that they're able to you know gain good influences or if they need to also make their own judgments with the right attitude. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Yeah, this has been, uh, it's been a really interesting, really interesting topic. Um, Extremely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I think at first, um, yeah, thanks for like, kind of guiding it into the right way. Because at first, my mind was just kind of thinking, okay, well, there's the, there's the obvious things, and then there is the, then there is like a topic, a bunch of topics you can jump from. But, you know, that was a bit broad. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, we we gotta have, have this conversation. Uh, all right, guys, this has been another episode of the Dance Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, see see you next time. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Take care, folks. Bye.